Hello, Behind the Knife listeners. We are very excited to be back with you for another journal club in colon and rectal surgery on diverticulitis with the Leahy Colorectal Surgery Team. Uh, as always, we have a ver another very, very special guest who's going to be joining us today, uh, and I'm going to introduce them shortly. Uh, so today we're going to talk about some articles central to the discussion on the management of diverticulitis. And so there are lots of different aspects of diverticulitis management that we thought about tackling, but the articles that we're going to focus on today really lay the groundwork for the ongoing COSMID trial, which stands for the comparison of surgery and medicine on the impact of diverticulitis. And this trial is currently ongoing, and it's a randomized superiority trial of elective colectomy versus best medical management for patients with quality of life limiting diverticular disease. And we are actually one of the sites enrolling patients uh, as are many centers around the country. So today we're gonna dive into the topic of surgery for diverticulitis. Is it better than medical management? So welcome to the team. So Dr. Peter West Marcello and Dr. Tess Hannah Allett. Well, hey guys, it's great to be back together. It seems like a long time. I Tess, I haven't spoken to you since about 3 a.m. Uh, <laughs> last, I think it was last weekend. Oh, boy. Yep. Thanks for the call. Yep. I hope it's going well. There we go. Uh, call out. <laughs> I had a great summer. Um, we spent time with Bianca out on the uh, uh, Portland uh, coast, which was awesome. But it's also September. And you know what that means? It's interview time. So I love seeing this year's applicants, applicants coming in. It's fun to talk about. The fellowship and residency and so uh it's great back to be with fall and football and yeah the Patriots won. Tess what's going on with you? Things are good at UMass uh, we have our new fellow Francis Hugh coming from Brigham and uh we are also excited for the new fellowship cycle to begin. But yeah not just new fellows but uh we do have a new baby around so congratulations on baby number two Dr. Olette. Oh. uh how's number two treating you? She's good she's good um her initials ended up being CEA, which I think is appropriate for a colorectal uh, child. That was not on purpose. That okay. uh, after the fact, <laughs> we. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so let me introduce our special guest who's going to be joining us. I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Jason Hall. Uh, so Dr. Hall did his general surgery training at Mass General Hospital, followed by his colon and rectal surgery fellowship at Leahy. Uh, after fellowship, Dr. Hall worked as a staff surgeon at Leahy. In his initial years, he received an MPH from Harvard, and his project was focusing on diverticular disease, and specifically outcomes of patients with diverticulitis treated at Leahy. Uh, he then became chief of colon rectal surgery at Boston Medical Center, and now is the chair of the Department of Surgery at Tufts Medical Center and the Benjamin Andrews Professor of Surgery. Dr. Hall is a renowned expert and leader in the management of diverticulitis, and the lead author on the ASCRS Clinical Practice Guidelines. And we are thrilled to have a Leahy alumni join us and share his expertise for this section. Welcome, sir. Glad to be with you guys. Awesome. So well, I'm just gonna say a few words though. You know, please. it's really great having Jason be with us. Um, and I give credit actually to Pat uh, working with Jason when he just was um, finishing up to say, you know, maybe uh, Jason was talking about getting his MPH at Harvard, but that plus the, but Pat putting forth uh, the monies for the research to get the, the scans reviewed, it really laid a lot of groundwork. Jason, tell us a little bit about that, though, because I think it'd be great for some of the, the residents to know, like, how, what happened and how it worked. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think I owe all of the credit to this to, um, Pat's vision um, and the family at Leahy, right? All of you know that Leahy colorectal is more like a a family, maybe even like a cult um, <laughs> that we all get initiated into. And uh, none of this is me. I mean, I was at Leahy, Pat thought I could do this um, I actually, when Pat raised the idea that we should take this huge database of patients with diverticulitis and CT scans, I said to her, Pat, I don't, I'm not sure I know how to do that work well. I need some extra training. And to her credit, she said, 
yeah, you probably do. And I'll fund um, not only you going to the Harvard School of Public Health, which Peter made happen by covering my call for three straight <laughs> summers. Um, <laughs> and then uh, she, uh, the other thing Pat Roberts did was she helped hire a group of folks to look through the scans and annotate each, you know, I don't remember how many studies we had over 700 patients included in the study and there were many that were excluded. Um, and so all of those scans, multiple scans had to be annotated and reviewed by folks that were trained and, and paid to do that work. Jason, you get so, out for doing a lot of hard work though, putting it all together to help us write about right. our experience and really I'll let you become uh, nationally, uh, internationally yeah. for your work. And that was the beginning. Well, but also, Jason is the king of burpees. You would see uh, Jason leading the groups uh, down the hallway as we're next to each other. So, John, yeah. let's dive into what we got. You got it. All right. So let's yeah, let's get into let's get into the weeds. So you know, this is such a common problem for colorectal and general surgeons. And so we're going to review two important studies. And so, for as common a problem as diverticulitis is, our basic understanding of the pathophysiology behind it and why patients develop it is still very much in evolution. And so in the last several decades, we have seen some paradigm shifts in the recommendations for who should have surgery um, and, and who should go on medical management. And so we hope to have a good discussion today on how that is still evolving. So we're gonna start off with the uh, five-year follow-up results of the direct trial, which looked at the long-term outcome of surgery versus conservative management for recurrent and ongoing complaints after an episode of diverticulitis. And we're then gonna discuss the laser randomized clinical trial on the quality of life and recurrence outcomes following laparoscopic elective sigmoid resection versus conservative treatment following diverticulitis. So let's, let, let's, get, let's get going. Tess, you wanna kick us off? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about the first paper, um, as John mentioned, the uh, five-year follow-up results of the direct trial. Uh, many of the guidelines suggest that for recurrent diverticulitis, the management should be tailored to the individual and how these recurrences impact a patient's quality of life. So these two trials are key in breaking that down more and better understanding how each management strategy impacts patients' quality of life. The direct trial was a randomized trial which compared elective sigmoid resection with non-operative management in patients with recurring diverticulitis. And they define this as greater than two episodes within two years or in patients with ongoing symptoms or complaints over three months after an episode of diverticulitis. The study was conducted by the Dutch Diverticular Collaborative, and this was from 2010 to 2024. There were 109 patients randomized to either elective sigmoid resection, um, there were 53, or conservative management, non-operative, uh, 56 of the patients were uh, in this arm. This was for left-sided diverticulitis that was supported by either CT scan or ultrasound or endoscopy. Ongoing complaints were patients having left lower quadrant abdominal pain and or changes in their bowel habits um, accompanied by CT evidence of ongoing inflammation or endoscopic changes such as hyperemia. Uh, this trial was of note um, terminated early due to difficulty in recruitment. Within three months of randomization, if patients were in the surgical arm, they underwent elective sigmoid colectomy with laparoscopy being the preferred approach. Non-operative patients were treated with the current practice of um, at the time, which was lifestyle measures, monitoring, fiber, uh, mesalamine and antibiotics were not routinely used. Um, and so the six month results of that study showed a significantly higher quality of life in patients who underwent sigmoid resection. The aim of this study, now looking at the five years, um, was to determine whether surgical or non-op treatment leads to higher quality of life with, in, the, in these patients with recurring diverticulitis at the five-year follow-up. So quality of life was a pro primary endpoint, and this was measured primarily by the gastrointestinal quality of life index, and they did this at five years. The, this score was significantly higher in the operative group with 67% of patients having a clinically relevant increase in their quality of life score. 
Secondary quality of life outcome measures were also higher in the operative group. Of note, 46% of patients in the medical management group ultimately required surgery due to ongoing symptoms. And those were successfully treated not um, non-operatively did not note significant improvement in the quality of life scores. The five-year follow-up data demonstrated results consistent with the initial six months um, that elective sigmoidectomy patients had higher and increased quality of life compared to the non-op group. So they concluded that surgeons should counsel patients on the improved quality of life, decreased pain, and lower risk of recurrence with surgical intervention, and the possibility of uh, balancing that with the possibility of post-op complications. Um, you know, the, the, the study was initially powered at 214 patients to detect a difference um, and it was ended early due to recruitment issues. This may, you know, overestimate the benefit of the treatment group. I think the study had a pretty high rate of reported complications as well. Um, but despite the higher complication rates that they found in this study, uh, quality of life was still higher in the surgical group. Um, and the, this follow-up study doesn't stratify, um, you know, by Hinchy classification, but the original trial most patients were Hinchy 1 um, and some were Hinchy 2. So I think overall, this study provides a good example of the natural history of diverticulitis, rates of recurrence, and how this impacts quality of life. Um, and, you know, really helpful in kind of counseling our patients. So Dr. Hall, comments. What do you think? Well, look, I mean, this is a... Uh... A seminal paper, um, even though it does not have some method methodologic issues. Um, before this paper, we were pretty much relegated to retrospective reviews, although some of them were well done, and I think the work done at Leahy was very good. Um, it was essentially a retrospective review of what happened to patients when they were treated with diverticulitis or surgery, but this is an actual randomized trial that compares the two treatment approaches in that group of patients that we struggle with the most. Um, and despite the met methodologic issues, I the finding is real, right? There is a very marked difference um, in the performance status and quality of life experience in patients who have surgery versus um, medical management. Now, you know, a randomized trial is a summary of the findings across a large group of patients. But, you know, I have to say this does um, converge with my own personal experience, that the patients that have multiple recurrent attacks, especially within a short period of time, um, or who have ongoing symptoms, are generally mostly helped by surgery. Um, and sometimes the medical treatment or the prolonged medical treatment is more torture for them, honestly. Peter, thoughts? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's, it is nice to see, you know, prospective randomized data. I think it's, as we will see with the other studies in ourselves, it's hard to recruit, but I'm glad that they did it. The one thing that I do want to highlight, though, is that the anastomotic leakage rate in the surgical group was... 15%. That's and, and the results were still beneficial. So it's amazing that even with what we might not call a great outcome, you still had quality of life benefits. Um, so I think it would be even probably more dramatic if you had a 5% or less anastomotic leak rate. And then the other part was the crossover that 46% of patients eventually go on to surgery. That's, that's a lot higher than what you might see elsewhere. And is that, is there cultural issues here that make you push on to getting surgery. So um, I think it's a great study. I think it's, it, it is, um, it helps us uh, lay the groundwork for what we're doing, but there were some quirks. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that the study was stopped for enrollment, but not the 15% leak. <laughs> right? like, yeah. I don't think, sure. <laughs> like, I don't think point. any of us would tolerate you know, you get run out of town pretty quickly with a 15% leak rate, right? But um, but that is one of the seminal findings. Despite obvious technical issues, the patient still felt better. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah. So let's, uh, I'm going to launch into our second paper, um, which, which nicely complements this one. So um, now we're going to talk about the, the, the laser randomized uh, clinical trial. So um, the aim of this study was to compare outcomes of elective sigmoid resection uh, and conservative management for patients with recurrent, complicated, or persistent painful diverticulitis at two-year follow-up. So this was a multi-center randomized clinical trial, uh, again, again, comparing elective laparoscopic sigmoid resection to conservative treatment, and this was at five Finnish hospitals. This was from 2014 to 2018, and they reported two-year follow-up. Uh, like the other study, the primary outcome was the difference in GI uh, quality of life index at six months. Uh, secondary outcomes were uh, that quality of life index at 12, 24, 48, and 96 months, uh, as well as postoperative complications and recurrences uh, within two years. Uh, so patients were included if they had three or more episodes of left colon diverticulitis within a two-year time period, with at least one episode verified by CT scan or prolonged pain or disturbance in bowel pattern for three months after a CT proven episode. Patients were excluded if they had a contraindication to laparoscopy, a stricture, a fistula, malignancy, prior sigmoid resection, uh, and then no colonoscopy within two years. So patients in the conservative group received standardized information on constipation and diverticulosis. They were advised to increase fiber. They were prescribed a fiber supplement. And then patients randomized to surgery, underwent surgery within three months of randomization. Uh, patients in the conservative group were managed for six months, and then at six months, they could have surgery if they desired, and then sooner if an indication arose. So 90 patients were included and randomized. Eight patients were in the conservative group who uh, actually underwent sigmoid resection within two years, so 18% crossover. Uh, and then in the first year, the mean quality of life index score was higher in the surgery group. Um, however, within two years, the scores were actually similar between the two groups. Uh, in the conservative group, 61% um, had a recurrent episode of diverticulitis compared to only 11% in the surgery group. So some important numbers to, to keep track of. So both the uh, GI quality of life index and SF26 scores were higher in the surgery group at 12 months, but similar between groups at 24 months. They did perform a per protocol analysis to try and overcome that crossover within the groups and did find that the GI quality of life index score was higher in the surgery group, both at 12 and at 24 months. Um, and they did also note that at 24 months, patients in the surgery group were more satisfied and reported less pain. Um, I'll just note that on intention to treat analysis, there was no difference in quality of life at two years. Uh, you know, I'll just comment that like the other trial, they did intend to enroll 133 patients, but the trial was prematurely stopped due to significant difference in the primary outcome and the interim analysis. So, you know, I'll just make some comments here. You know, in this study, the uh, rate of crossover was 18% compared to the other study of 46%, um, you know, which could limit the ability to detect differences between the two groups. Um, trial results were definitely similar in some regard to direct trial at one year. Um, you know, this group was heterogeneous, complicated, persistent, painful, and recurrent diverticulitis were all included, which does make it more challenging to apply more broadly. Um, and they overall conclude that elective sigmoid resection improved quality of life and decreased recurrence of diverticulitis and provides useful information uh, for counseling patients. So Dr. Hall, curious what your thoughts are about this paper and then how this one combined with the other one, you know, really informs your practice. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when I read this, it's a similar finding. And again, we have some of the same uh, bugaboos with these kind of randomized trials in terms of enrolling the appropriate number of patients. Um, but again, I think this tells us the big picture, surgery is effective. Um, I don't know if you have the table four included, which shows sort of some of the other complications we, we worry about in this group of patients, but I think um, is some of the longer term issues like fistulas and those kind of things are actually higher in the observation group, but not statistically significant. So again, um, uh, you know, I think it just supports applying surgery as a as a primary modality. 
Yeah. And, and I got to say, when I look at this one, the leak rate was 5%, you know, a much more realistic number where you expect the crossover was also a lot less, you know, done, done in a different uh, country. So culturally, things are different. I think it is hard, though, to, to ask somebody who's having chronic pain from diverticulitis to say, don't have surgery. <laughs> so that that affects your quality of life. I think in you know in America, if you had persistent disease, you know we know that the I think for that group who have chronic pain versus the intermittent episodic pain, right. uh, the other, other part of this is you know no antibiotic therapy generally used for some cases and not. So there are some differences, and I think maybe we'll see that when it comes to uh, the U.S. trial. But I, I, again, together it still says that that surgery uh, provides equal, if not better, quality of life. Yeah. So, yeah, I think and, and I think that's a good, you know, segue into the Cosmid trial, you know, so so of note, right, both of these trials were done in Europe. Um, and so, um, you know, this is a trial that's ongoing right now. And the PI is uh, Dr. David Flum. And then, you know, Dr. Tom Reed is 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 also leading the charge. Um, you know, so the goal of this trial is to answer the question for patients with quality of life limiting diverticular disease is elective colectomy more effective than best medical management. Uh, and so the hypothesis that they're, that they're testing uh, is that patient reported outcomes among patients in the surgery arm will be superior to those in the best man medical management arm. Um, you know, I, I'll just mention, you know, I'm not gonna go through all of the inclusion exclusion criteria. There's a lot of very uh, similar inclusion criteria to the other studies. Um, you know, essentially, and I'll, and I'll just say this because I've, you know, we, like I said, we have um, been enrolling patients in this. So it's essentially at least one episode of diverticulitis. It can't be, quote unquote, complicated with a fistula or malignancy. You need to have had a colonoscopy within five years. Um, and then again, the primary outcome is patient reported quality of life as measured by the GI quality of life index. You know, I'll just mention that the trial started enrolling in 2019 and then the pandemic hit. Um, you know, I, I wasn't trying was to enroll tough. patients then, but from what I what I hear, um, it was challenging that the trial sounded a little bit like COVID. Um, but now, you know, obviously we're we're beyond that, and so you know, um, enrollment is is up and running. So we've enrolled over 100, 200, excuse me, enrolled over two hundred patients across the country, and Leahy's enrolled seven. Uh, so that's been really fun to participate in that. So you know, Dr. Hall, you know, thoughts about Cosmid and its role, um, you know, in, in sort of your your practice and how you see that contributing to the literature. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to replicate or to get some facsimile of the, of the direct and the laser trials done in the States because practice patterns may be very different. For example, the Europeans led the charge on non-antibiotic management of diverticular disease. That never really caught on here in the States. I My bias, although I you know I'm not sure like I can really prove this is that we're actually more aggressive surgically here in the States than in Europe. That may be a big generalization, but that's my sense. So my thinking is that, you know, this is a good study to do in the States. My, uh, the only concern I actually have about the Cosmic trial, because I was there at the beginning of sort of the discussions of this is um, what constitute best medical management um, it's not as clearly defined in COSMID as it was in the other randomized trials. And I think that has the potential to dilute the results. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's probably the best you're going to do uh, in the States because it's hard to tell people exactly what med best medical management is. and It, it might be like herding cats to, to really put a tight definition on that. Um, so, so I anxiously await accrual of this trial. It, it, it is terrible that it got kind of launched just before the pandemic, um, because it would have been a hard trial to enroll in under normal circumstances. Yeah, but I'm just happy that it is getting done. And if you look at the numbers, we're already at 200. No, so, it's great. I think yeah, what, so, I mean, we're what already 500. Much, much much greater than what we're seeing from uh, in Europe. Yeah. And I think we will accrue because I think people are now feeling back more towards quote normal. Tess, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I think I'm looking forward to the results, um, you know, getting more information to help us guide counseling patients. I think even between the two studies we've already talked about, um, you know, there's a lot of variability in the literature. Um, 
you know, who's at risk for recurrence, both with and without surgery. Um, as a fellow at Leahy, um, you know, often referenced, uh, heard a lot about Dr. Hall's paper um, from DCR looking at the long-term follow-up that I think we were talking about earlier, you know, looking at the initial episode of diverticulitis and what are predictors of recurrence when counseling patients. Um, Dr. Hall and the Leahy group looked at the um, clinical predictors uh, and CT predictors of recurrence after your first episode of diverticulitis um, that was managed successfully non-operatively. And so what they found was overall recurrence at five years was 36%. Complicated recurrence was low at 3.9%. I think that's an important you know, number to, to know. Um, family history of diverticulitis, length of the colonic segment involved, um, retroperitoneal abscess were all high risk um, features of recurrence. Um, so again, for as common as diverticulitis is, we still need a lot more help in guiding conversation with patients. Um, I don't know. I remember it, as a fellow hearing about a Leahy score. Is that still in the works? <laughs> work never completed. <laughs> Sloppy work in <laughs> Dr. Hall. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's what I say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, uh, one of our partners, Dr. Sridharidi, is, is has sort of um, uh, rejuvenated the, resurrected the project, I should say, and we presented a couple of interesting findings at ASTRS this past year. We're in the process of submitting for for publication. Um, you know, I will just mention that there is supposed to be a COSMID score. So, you know, they fill out a bunch of uh, information about their quality of life before or before they're enrolled. And so I, and, and so part of the thought is that you can then go to a patient and say, okay, take these survey questions, it pumps out a score, and then that should potentially indicate to you whether or not surgery would be beneficial. I think, you know, that will depend on the final accrual numbers and whether or not they're able to generate that. Um, so. Well, um, I want to pick Jason's brain a little bit, because uh, it's something I've sort of been always sort of thinking about is, is what about patients who present, you know, early in their symptoms versus delayed? You know, I try to look back to sort of, can we find literature that would say that uh, uh, it makes intuitive sense that if you present earlier, you're probably less likely to have less complicated disease. And if you have symptoms for 10, 7 to 10 days, you know, that you're going to have more complicated disease with your first bout. Um, you know, and I think it's been my experience that, you know, yeah, young men are stupid. They, they wait a week on a little dog. I thought it was... <laughs> It's the, it's the flu. Uh, you know, do we, Jason, do we have any data that says yeah. that longer duration of symptoms make more complicated disease? There, um, there are uh, a couple papers, um, some of them, from, like at least one of them from the States, LA, that look at um, the number of incident cases of diverticulitis in the same patient. Um, and the um, complexity of the operation as judged by operative blood loss and those kind of things. And as you might predict, um, the more attacks that you've had, the harder the operation was to do and the higher chances of complicated disease um, in the patients that had like four, five, six, and seven. So there is definitely something to um, what you're saying. And, you know, um, I think all of us have been in the situation where we're operating on somebody who's had seven attacks treated with diverticulitis, maybe had got admitted and somehow got through it. And you're there at like 7.30 at night wrestling against the colon, which is fused to the left ureter and the retroperitoneum, right? Like, I think everybody on in this call can relate to that. So um, it's kind of, it's interesting to me because this goes back to the literature in the seventies, right? Uh, where, where you would bring up a colostomy, leave the septic focus in place. Um, and there's a reason that that strategy got abandoned, right? Cause the patients never really improved. Um, and so, um, I think there is something, Peter, to earlier management. Um, uh, I don't know where that line is. I think it's pretty individual. Um, but, yeah. Interesting. Well, 
great discussion as always. And we really thank you uh, for joining us, Dr. Hall. Let's get to some of our, our takeaways. So Tess, why don't you get it started for us? Yeah. So I think um, when you're reading the literature, understand the patient population before you just apply it to your patient. Um, everyone is different. Um, and then make sure when you're discussing surgery to really be considering patient's quality of life. Awesome. Marcelo's must knows. Yeah, well, I think if you're going to do an elective resection for diverticular disease, you need high quality outcomes, which means you can't have high leak rates. You've got to do quality work with excellent perioperative outcomes to really derive, I think, the best benefits. And I do think there's some biases that I think complicated cases may be preventable if you present sooner in your course rather than later. And um, we do need more multi-center studies together. And I hope, Jason, that we across the country will do better at ASCRS, mm -hmm. allowing these trials and future studies together to share work and to share data. But um, look forward to the Cosmos results. Paul's highlights. Hit us yeah, look, I, I think both of these studies, like the take home message is that when you have a patient that's suffering, surgeons have a certain set of skills that still do work, right? Uh, I agree with Peter. If, if we're going to, if surgery is the solution, it's got to be high quality. You certainly can't have a 15% anastomotic leak rate. One thing I am encouraged about the COSMIS study is the enthusiasm in the surgical community for that study was very, very, very high. Um, even before the pandemic, the investigator room for the study was full of surgeons wanting to participate. So I do think it, it, it's going to accrue successfully um, and hopefully it will give us some additional insights. John, awesome. Helpful. Yeah, Abelson's approach. I, I I really try to focus on the patient-centered approach. Um, you know, I, I struggle, at least in my earlier staging career, to tell a patient, you know, unless they have a cancer, you have to do this surgery. Um, so I really do try to, to, to make it, you know, what do you think is the best thing for you? Obviously, you know, I'm there to provide guidance about risks and benefits of each of the different approaches. I will say I, I've really, really enjoyed being able to be a part of the, the trial and enrolling patients. Um, and so I think, you know, always look for ways that you can, you know, contribute your experience to, you know, the, the body of re research, um, you know, so we can advance how we're taking care of patients. So, all right. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, so again, if you like diving into the weeds with us, consider joining us Sunday evenings for our colorectal surgery virtual education series. Uh, you can check out our show notes for this episode uh, for more details. Uh, and we do hope we continue to have the privilege of creating content for you in the future. So if you enjoyed this session, please take a minute or two out of your hectic day and leave us a review. And as Behind the Knife says, until the next time, gang, dominate, dominate the day. The day.